Welcome to the featured conversation with U.S. Supreme Court Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Amy Coney Barrett. This, this program is being live broadcast. No photography or videography is allowed in the theater except by the designated cameras. Now, please welcome to the stage George Washington University Provost Christopher Allen Bracey. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, look at that. Very nice. Thank you. I am delighted to welcome you all to the George Washington University and to this important civic learning forum. We are very happy to be hosting this event in partnership with Louise Dubé and iCivics, and we are delighted to welcome our distinguished guests. I would like to extend a special welcome to Associate Justice Amy Coney Barrett, and Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who we are very honored to have here today. One of the key elements of GW's academic mission is that we provide our students with the knowledge and skills to become experts in their fields and eventually change makers and leaders in their communities and their careers. With GW's alumni community more than 320,000 strong, our students' coursework, their research, internships, and extracurriculars have a direct and significant impact on the future of the nation and of the world. Many of our students' interests lie in civic engagement and public service. GW has been cited as one of the most politically active higher education institutions in the nation, and with many opportunities available to GW students to leverage their skills and resources to making a difference in their community, our undergraduate students are often drawn to GW to continue and deepen the civic engagement and education that they received in their K through 12 education. GW's work in civic education extends beyond our current student body to include K through 12 students in the community. As one example, the Honey Nashman Center a co-sponsor of this event offers a summer program called Civic Change Makers, in which middle schoolers work with local elected officials and civic leaders to address concerns in their own neighborhoods, like broken fences, teen homelessness, and gun violence. Along the way, the students come to understand the civic landscape of their community and of the city. They have spoken with mayor and superintendent, asking them to sign a contract to help them fix fences. We also have one of the great law schools in the nation. And I don't say that merely because I'm a law professor and a former interim dean of the law school. Our law students choose GW Law because they want to make an immediate contribution to the civic institutions in our city and in the nation's capital through a broad array of areas of study, clinics, research centers, initiatives, and more. In fact, our law students and faculty are contributing directly to high school civic education. For example, GW Law's Animal Law, Animal Law Education Initiative works with uh, Coolidge High School's AP seminar students to teach them about legal issues in, related to animal cruelty. And then the clinic supported them for a year conducting research on issues of their choice. And they were ultimately presented uh, reports to the law school community for feedback. These are two examples, but they just represent a fraction of the commitment and support for civic education, both for our own students and faculty and for students in K through 12 in the region. Now, I know that Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor was a driving force behind these annual forums and more generally of the renewal of civic learning throughout our country. GW believes firmly that civic learning should be among the highest of goals of American education, and we are particularly delighted to host the productive convening that will occur here. Thank you. Let's now give a round of applause for Deborah Sanchez from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon. At CBB, I am the Senior Vice President of Education, and I'm so pleased to be here. I want to thank Louise Dubay for inviting me here today. And CPB is pleased to sponsor Civic Learning Week because it aligns so closely 
with our mission to advance civil discourse and strengthen America's democratic foundation through public media's trusted content, our news and information, and our educational resources. We know that civic learning is necessary for a healthy democracy, and it can be a unifying force for our country, particularly during times of deep division. CPB has a long and proud history of supporting civic education to help teach children and lifelong learners about American citizenship, our democracy, and the fundamentals of government. I'm gonna highlight some of our most recent work. The Civics Collection on PBS Learning Media, created by Boston Station GBH, will help teach middle and high school students about the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, the founding principles of our Constitution, and explore issues of government policy and decision-making with a robust set of media-rich, interactive educational resources. Students will also see themselves reflected in the media, which we heard today was so important, that features multiple perspectives and multiple stories. The collection will be available to teachers nationwide this fall. Premiering this summer on PBS Kids is Together We Can, a new music series from the creators at Sesame Workshop for children ages four to eight, though I guarantee it will be fun for all ages. Together We Can consists of 20 live action music videos that cover civics topics such as the importance of rules and rights, voting, symbols of our democracy, and our constitution. As a sneak peek, one of the videos is called 50 States in Our Country, which teaches the foundations of government in a modern doo-wop style. Another civic education series is City Island, an animated video series for six to nine-year-olds that can be found everywhere you find PBS Kids content. The community members of City Island are actually objects, mailboxes, lampposts, cars, and more, and are the main characters who demonstrate in age-appropriate ways how people live and work together to make decisions and to solve problems. And as we look forward to 2026 and the 250th anniversary of our nation's founding, CPB and all of us in public media are examining how best we can inform public discourse. Two weeks ago, we announced our plans for the launch of Civic Spark, a short form digital content and engagement initiative that will ask Americans from all walks of life the question, what is your civic spark? We want Americans everywhere to consider the defining moment or experience that awakened the realization that they could make a difference through public service and through community engagement. As CPB CEO, Pat Harrison said when she introduced Civic Spark, we are convinced that another America is waiting to be heard and that voices of hate, racism, and polarization have had their platform for far too long. There are so many Americans working quietly every day in ways that define who we are as people. We look forward to sharing more about this exciting initiative very soon. Thank you again for the time today, and we look forward to working with you all in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Lastly, we'll hear from Jerry Mannion at the Carnegie Corporation of New York to share a few words. Yes, hi. Um, happy Civic Learning Week, and congratulations to you all for a great convening. Carnegie Corporation is thrilled to support iCivics and the Civics Now Coalition in the vital work of advancing civic education policies at both the state and federal levels. Civics is needed now more than ever, given the declining civic knowledge in K-12 system, but frankly, among all Americans. The lack of civic knowledge contributes to both civic disengagement and a lack of trust in our government and our democracy. Carnegie is a long-term advocate for better civic education in the schools, and today we have released a new report, Connecting Civic Education and a Healthy Democracy, highlighting the need for state-level policy change to expand and improve K-12 civic learning. You will see the postcards, here's my plop prop, um, at, uh, at the resource desk with a QR code to download the report from our website, carnegie.org. 
And we would also, um, you could also check out online how your state is doing as far as civic education goes. Our great communications team will be highlighting the report on our social media, and I would love to if you could all help amplify it. Thank you for all you do every day for strengthening our democracy. We appreciate you. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to U.S. Supreme Court Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Amy Coney Barrett in conversation with Eric Liu from Citizen University. Welcome, everybody. Justices, it's uh, so great to have you here to help celebrate uh, Civic Learning Week. Uh, for those of you who um, are tuning in or uh, here uh, for the first part of, weren't here for the first part of the day, this is inaugurating a full week of activity all around the United States to emphasize the centrality of civic learning uh, in this time uh, and in our ability to govern ourselves uh, in this democratic republic. And uh, we are so delighted uh, to be joined here by Justices Sotomayor and Barrett. Uh, they need no introduction, but uh, I feel compelled to provide one nonetheless um, and want to kind of uh, add respect both for their offices and for their achievements uh, to, to share what we have here. So um, Justice Sonia Soto Sotomayor, Associate Justice, uh, was born in the Bronx on June 25th, 1954. She earned a BA uh, from Princeton University, uh, graduating summa cum laude, and member of Phi Beta Kappa and receiving the Pine Prize, the highest academic honor Princeton awards to an undergraduate. In 1979, she earned a JD from Yale Law School where she served as editor and editor of the Yale Law Journal. Um, she later served as an assistant district attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office uh, and then litigated international commercial matters at the New York, in New York City at the firm of Tavia and Harcourt where she served in as an associate and later a partner. Um, in 1991, President George H.W. Bush nominated her to the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York, and she served in that role from 1992 to 1998. In 1997, she was nominated by President Bill Clinton to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, where she served from 1998 to 2009. And then President Barack Obama nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court on May 26, 2009, and she assumed this role August 8th, 2009. <clears throat> Associate Justice Amy Coney Barrett was born in New Orleans, Louisiana on January 28th, 1972. Uh, she married Jesse M. Barrett in 1999. They have seven children, Emma, Vivian, Tess, John, Peter, uh, Liam, Juliet, and Benjamin. She received a BA from Rhodes College and a JD from Notre Dame Law School. She served as a law clerk for Judge Lawrence uh, Silberman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit from 1997 to 1998, and for Justice Antonin Scalia of the Supreme Court of the United States during the 1998 term. After two years in private practice in Washington, D.C., she became a law professor joining the faculty of Notre Dame Law School in 2002. She was appointed a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in 2017. President Donald J. Trump nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and she took her seat on October 27, 2020. I want to begin, Justices, um, with just recognizing this time that we're in, uh, both Civic Learning Week itself uh, and the centrality of th those themes, um, and also the time uh, that we're in in this country. Uh, we are approaching in a couple of years the 250th anniversary of the nation's founding. Um, and not unlike the bicentennial nearly half a century ago, uh, there are a lot of debates, often contentious, about who we are as a country and where we're headed. And one of the things that has uh, been true across the board, left and right, in the United States these days has been a declining level of confidence and faith in institutions. Um, and before we get into the specifics of civic learning, I wanted to begin with you just on this question of confidence in public institutions and why from your vantage point, sitting um, on the highest court of the land, 
uh, why this word that seems kind of abstract, we talk about trust, we talk about confidence, but um, you know, we, we know it when it disappears. We don't think about it much when it's there. Uh, and I'm curious for each of you why you feel like confidence in institutions um, is so central in the first place, not only to civic learning, but to civic life itself. Uh, just as Sotomayor, we'll start with you. I think, Eric, you pointed out what the essence of the problem is. Um, famous saying, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when asked what kind of government we had, his response was a republic if you can keep it. And as my colleague, Neil, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote in one of his books on this theme, he said, um, it's a messy thing, government. It's a messy thing, a republic. It's a lot of voices that you're trying to harmonize, to function together. And the entire structure of our Constitution, and I think every school child and probably every adult heard that we're a, a system of checks and balances, mm -hmm. that we have three branches of government, that each of them has a function, and that they serve their functions but balance each other So, in an attempt to get things right. When there is discord within one of those branches or without it or between them, that system is going to see its cracks. And eventually it can fail. Um, and the failing starts with small things and they can move to large things. So when we don't have, for example, a functioning executive, you will likely see the legislative branch stepping in. If you don't have a functioning legislative branch, you are tempting the executive to take more responsibility or do more things mm. than they were meant to. Similarly, you challenge a court because if the other two branches are overstepping or not stepping up to their obligations, the citizenry is going to look to the courts to solve problems that it really shouldn't. Um, all of these present dangers to the society. That's why I do think that having confidence in our the, the people's confidence that our that our branches of government can function means that our republic can function. Mm. And without it, we lose something very fundamental. Mm. Justice Barrett. Yes, I, I agree with Justice Sotomayor that confidence in institutions is important because it's institutions that allow our republic to flourish. And you know, you asked Eric, what can we do to restore confidence in institutions? I mean, I think institutions are responsive to the people. And I think one thing that institutions have lost a sense of is that we're a pluralistic society. They've lost the sense of, perhaps, the ability to compromise, which is hardwired into the Constitution. It takes compromise to pass legislation, for example. Um, and I, I feel like, maybe in this era of polarization, of, of some would say bitter polarization, that that ability to compromise is being lost. But institutions, I think, reflect back some things that are present in the citizenry themselves. Um, and so, you know, I think that's true of our docket. If you want to know, Justice O'Connor used to say, if you want to know what's going on in America, then you can look at our docket and you can see some of the, the battles that are being waged through litigation are often reflective of the battles that are being waged in the society at large. But I think if we demand of our institutions um, compromise, I mean, what if we started a campaign for compromise and a campaign for kindness and made clear that those are the kinds of things that we want to see in our civic institutions? I think we shouldn't underestimate the ability of the citizenry to demand that kind of change. You know, part of what you're both speaking to is that a public that might be losing certain levels of faith or confidence in institutions can't be chided or scolded into increasing their confidence. You can't tell the people, you should trust us more, you should believe more in these institutions. You're both naming a way in which participants in these institutions, in any branch of government, and frankly, in non-governmental institutions, bear responsibility for um, setting those norms that you're describing, of making it so that the actual practice of power and the ways that arguments are either litigated literally or just dealt with figuratively um, uh, don't result in that scorched earth, uh, bitter polarization that you're talking about. And so um, in many ways, you've already named some of the core elements of what all of us here who are involved in the work of civic learning think of when we talk about that phrase. Most Americans don't walk around thinking, you know, today I want to get a little smarter on civic learning. Want, want, uh, they should. Uh, they should. <laughs> they should. And that's our message, right? Uh, because the fact that they can walk around 
and take a million things for granted um, in a self-governing society is itself the product um, of prior generations having done a little bit of thinking uh, about what that means. But you've named uh, three elements in particular. You've named core civic knowledge. Um, you've already referred to branches of government. Uh, and it is uh, kind of a, a sad running uh, uh, comment uh, in civic discussions how few Americans can name all three branches of government. Uh, uh, but, but knowledge is one piece. You've talked about skills, the skills of compromise, the skills of uh, understanding the ways in which power flows and when one branch um, is receding in, uh, in one way, another branch might actually uh, move to fill a vacuum. Uh, and those are skills of understanding people and situations. Um, and finally, you've talked about norms. You've talked about norms and values and the ways in which we behave. And that kind of triad of knowledge, skills, and norms uh, is foundational to any of the work of civic learning here. And implicit in all three of them is a word that you already both use, and that is power. Now, a lot of the conversation about the Constitution is about separation of powers, right? Um, but I'm curious from your vantage point, because the language you use of the law is a language of power. Um, how can we, all of us in this room, do more to educate Americans in general, who aren't necessarily following the Supreme Court docket, um, but who understand vaguely what's going on, how can we educate people more deeply in what power means and what it means actually to separate power and what power exists in government and outside of government? That, that literacy, that basic literacy in power is something that seems to be absent um, in our society and that leads people to jump to conclusions or have a picture of what a court should do when a court can't do that or, uh, or expect certain things of people that they can't possibly deliver. And so how do you speak more broadly about power um, to a public in a democracy? Well, I think the work that you do and the work that iCivics does brings those lessons home to the citizenry and, and engages people in those conversations. I know there are educators present, I think, in our schools. Um, I, I love talking to schools. I mean, I was a professor for a long time. I think education is a big piece of it. We open the Supreme Court. I know that um, all of us wind up talking to groups that come through the court to try to open the doors so they can see what goes on and talk about the way that we make decisions, the way that we approach the Constitution. And, and I think sometimes storytelling can, mm. can really help to draw people in. One, one story that I like to tell, which some of you may know, is the story of Greg Watson, the sophomore at the University of Texas, who's responsible for the ratification of the 27th Amendment. He was writing a college paper, discovered that the 27th Amendment, which is about uh, what well, says that sitting Congress cannot give itself a pay raise or a pay cut. That amendment had been proposed by James Madison in 1789. Watson discovered in 1982 that there was no time limit on its ratification. And he was single-handedly responsible over a 10-year period of a one-man campaign to get the states to ratify it. And I think when I've told that story to younger students and to high school students, it kind of energizes them because they think about one person being able to be invested in the Constitution and making a difference. So I think the power of stories and telling mm. stories like that can also help draw people in. Justice Sotomayor, you also use story in a lot of ways. Uh, I use stories all the time, as you know, Eric. Um, to me, storytelling is perhaps the best way to teach. And you are right, but I think maybe uh, your question has to focus in on what our responsibilities are as and I want to use the word citizen with a small c. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about immigration status. I am talking about citizenship in terms of community and whether each of us as members of a larger community, what obligations we have to undertake, not just to teach, but to learn. Mm. And I think that's the ingredient that's missing. Um, we've got, a, thankfully, we have organizations like iCivics and yours that are involved in the teaching aspect of it. But how many of you in this room have read the Constitution cover to cover? Oh, well, <laughs> Not fair. This is, a, this is a room full of ringers. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, but I will say that this is not generally the response. Uh, I speak to a lot more diverse audiences. And very few hands go up. And I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I ask the same question of many audiences. How many of you have actually read a Supreme Court decision cover to cover? Again, 
a very atypical audience. Think about your normal friends, mm -hmm. and, and I shouldn't say normal, not that they're <laughs> more normal than they, but think of your regular friends not involved in the kind mm -hmm. of work that you're involved in, and you will find that most people really don't take the time to learn. And so I think that there are two components to this. There's the component of what we, the responsibility we all have as members of the larger community to teach where we can but our equal responsibility as citizens of the community to learn. Mm -hmm. And so we need the two things working hand in hand. I'm really glad, Justice, that you talked about that kind of capacious ethical notion of citizen, small c citizenship, as mm -hmm. you put it. Um, um, in our work at Citizen University, we often say that to understand that conception of citizenship, there's a simple equation that power plus character equals citizenship, that to live as a member, a contributing member of the body of the community, is to both have some understanding of power and, and fluency in, in the central question of all civic power, which you two embody on the court, which is who decides at any scale, in a county commission, on a school board, um, in a family, um, who decides is the central question of how power is flowing. And of course, your work product is called decisions. Uh, you, you are literally making decisions and then codifying them uh, for a public um, at the same time, you, you know, you talk about what, what an abnormal group of people this is in this room here today, we civic nerds who've uh, <laughs> co co come for Civic Learning Week. Um, and the truth of the matter is that most, most Americans, even if they had the will, don't have the time to actually read Supreme Court decisions, uh, to decipher them, to understand um, what's meant and implied in different references and uh, footnotes and so forth. Um, and so the question of how organizations like iCivics, like Citizen University, like so many that are represented in this room today, the Institute for C Citizen Scholars, Generation Citizen, um, the, the Reagan Institute, there's so many people in this room here whose work is about actually translation, the translation of things that happen at a very high level in decision making um, to a way that can actually uh, reach everyday Americans. And that too is the core of civic learning. And I think for both of you, um, you're here not out of some sense of uh, obligation to iCivics. You're here because you are both educators uh, by both uh, profession in the past, but also just by, by nature. Uh, you like to explain and to make things understandable to folks. And I want to actually just reroute this question back in the both of you. Why civic education? Why has this mattered to you um, in your own evolution uh, and your own personal um, sense of how things work in the world. Uh, what, what was formative for you um, in civic learning uh, that's brought you here today? Well, I had two things. The first is when I was a junior in high school, I was working for a hospital in the South Bronx. And the owner was, uh, probably couldn't happen today, supporting a local candidate uh, for mayor. And he volunteered my services to the candidate. <laughs> um, it was my first exposure to electoral politics. I hadn't even thought of doing it. And it was wonderful for me to be in that office as a 17-year-old um, and watching the passion with which these people supported the candidate. And I watched volunteers coming in and out uh, who were knocking on doors and getting the vote out. And I realized that as citizens, we could have a voice, um, that uh, politics was not divorced from the people. It is the people. And so that was my first realization as a teenager that I could volunteer and do things and make a difference. I couldn't vote yet, but I could still do things that were important to help um, in governance. The second was when I was at college at Princeton, I read in a local newspaper, I worked in the library, and one of the wonderful things about um, the library then Firestone, I don't, now it's probably all digital and I sort of <laughs> miss the day when I could walk into um, the beginning space where there were all newspapers laid out. But I would daily go in there and just flip through them. But I read an article about a man from Puerto Rico who had, uh, whose plane had been diverted to Newark. And he didn't understand what was going on. 
and was quite upset at the airport. The policeman who intervened uh, didn't, couldn't or didn't have translators available and thought that he was acting in a um, bizarre manner. They took him to Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper was reporting that it took a week for him to convince someone mm -hmm. to call his family so they could come and get him out. And I was so struck by that story that um, there weren't enough at that time. That's totally changed now. But at that time, um, that's many years ago, Amy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Close to when you were born. Uh, but, at, <laughs> but at that time, um, uh, the hospital had very few Spanish-speaking people, mm -hmm. the, the psychiatric center. And I organized the Hispanic students on campus to once a week go and meet with the patients for a couple of hours and just talk to them to have some contact in their native language to assist them with calls, and some of them did ask us to pass messages to family or things of that nature. And um, sometimes all we did at Christmas was bring them home cooked food. And hmm. I didn't do that, but friends were good enough to do that. <laughs> um, bring them home cooked food and, and um, uh, play music with them. And I realized that uh, civic engagement is not merely electoral politics. Hmm. And that's what so many people think of, that civic responsibility or engagement involves being an elected official or a government official in some way. It's not just that. It's something much bigger. Hmm. It's about every act we do in that small C citizen to help solve a problem that the community has. Hmm. And that kind of engagement is what I call civic engagement. Hmm. It is not just electoral or government structure, but community structure. And what we each undertake as individuals to help resolve the difficulties in the world around us. Well, there's a living example of power plus character, but it's also a, a, an example of the ways in which those elements we were describing of knowledge, skills, and norms, when you have them, don't just sit there. They're not an inert bundle of things. They come to life in the doing. They come to life in the choices you make to participate or not. But, but that was by choice. And, and those two incidents really sort of propelled my interest in community involvement. Hmm. And it continued throughout my career. Um, obviously, I went into public service when I was a prosecutor. But when I was in private practice, I volunteered on a state agency and on a city agency and in a civil rights organization. So it, it's not just the work you do every day that pays you. Um, that probably is critical, obviously, to our society, but more important is the work you do when you're not being paid. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and we didn't talk about this in advance, but my answer would in many ways track Justice Sotomayor's. Um, I, I didn't have any experience in electoral politics you know, at all um, growing up or even any time before I went on the bench. When I was growing up, I don't really recall ever talking about politics at dinner or having a yard sign for a candidate, but my parents were very invested, very civic-minded. So when I was a child, um, I, I don't remember why our precinct lost its polling place, but it did. And so my parents volunteered their garage. So for many years- This was in New Orleans? This was in New Orleans. So for many years, our garage was where people came to vote. <laughs> and I, I can remember, and this wasn't a convenient thing for my parents <laughs> from early in the morning to late at night, and the, it wasn't a convenient thing for our immediate neighbors either because there was a lot of traffic and cars parked along the road. But they, they saw a need, and so they volunteered their home to fill it. But much as Justice Sotomayor was saying about investment in our communities, um, that's something also that was my parents made a big value for us growing up because when they saw the needs, needs they filled them. You know, I, I, the elderly in my neighborhood, my mom was bringing them food, my dad was checking in on them, and they were dispatching my siblings and I to go visit them and have conversations with them so that they would not be lonely. My mother fostered a baby when we were younger. 
And all of those things of seeing needs and filling them, we participated in toy drives at Christmas every year. My siblings and I would go out and help wrap the gifts and then deliver them. And those things, I think, um, that kind of engagement in the community that's not governmental or political, but that's rooted in our community, that's what self-government requires. It requires working together as a community just because you're people, people before politics. You know, you work together, you're invested in a community, you see needs, and you fill them, be it need for translation, for visiting those who are lonely, offering care to those who need it. Those are the kinds of things that knit us together as a community. Well, that uh, opening up the garage uh, for a precinct uh, station is, is literally bringing democracy home. And, uh, lo lo love that. Um, we want to center um, several questions that um, young people uh, have uh, brought into the room. Uh, iCivics, uh, who's our host and catalyst here, works with so many young people and educators around the United States. And we've curated um, several that I believe uh, we have in a video, which um, we can play now. Um, and what we'll do is we'll hear all three of these questions and then um, we'll come back and I'll, I'll repeat and kind of paraphrase them um, so that we can recollect the thread of the conversation. But let's, let's play that video if we can. Hello, my name is Howard and I'm in 11th grade. I go to school in Berwyn, Pennsylvania. My question that I would like to ask the justices is what do you consider some of your most formative civic experiences that put you on the path to the Supreme Court? Okay, well, I sort of jumped the gun on Howard. Hi, <laughs> my name is Tiffany, and I'm in ninth grade. I go to school in Plainsboro, New Jersey. I would like to ask, considering the diverse backgrounds and viewpoints among the Supreme Court justices, how do you navigate differences? Also, are there norms or practices that you follow to help navigate disagreements, whether in the majority or minority? Hi. My name is Bola and I'm in 12th grade and I go to school in West Hartford, Connecticut. The question that I have for the justices would be, given the importance of understanding civics in a democracy, what advice would you offer to students, particularly in terms of fostering a deeper understanding of civic engagement and also the legal system? Also, do you have any specific advice for those interested in pursuing careers in law and public service? Wonderful. Um, Hello. My name is Maurits and I'm in 11th grade. I go to school in Hialeah, Florida. My question is, how can young folks be encouraged to find common ground in a world filled with so much polarization? Okay. Yes, indeed. Our thanks to Howard, Titi, Bola, and Maurits. And um, you know, Howard's first question, you began to speak to about formative uh, civic experiences um, and there was a kind of um, a through line be between what, how you both answered that initial question in talking about place, uh, in talking about being rooted in community. Um, this precinct station in New Orleans, um, you know, if you, if you had more time, you probably could have done a, done a second line parade, come into your, <laughs> your, your garage and done it New Orleans style, right? Uh, um, what you were doing um, in New York uh, and uh, New Jersey um, was rooted in the texture of that community in that place and at that time, the, the demographics that were beginning to change and the need that you felt. And, um, and so I guess one variation on this question of formative civic experiences is uh, the role of place in forming your sense uh, of civic engagement and civic responsibility, um, whether that was the New Orleans phase of your life or another place or the, uh, the, the, you know, the Bronx phase of your life. I should say that most civic learning starts in the home. Amy gave her examples of the, the sort of bigger step than most people do, but many, many parents will organize gift giving to the needy either at Thanksgiving or at Christmas. My mother, for example, was a nurse and she helped anybody in the community who required some assistance in their physical care. Uh, my mom was there. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I opened the door to a stranger, and this isn't the day when you could do that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they would say, I've heard is ex Selena live here, and I heard that she's a nurse and might help me. Um, those examples were critical to us. And I do hope that I emphasize for most parents that you are the first 
learning experience for most children. Mm -hmm. And so that road to civic learning comes, starts almost always at the home. Mm -hmm. School is, I think, the second, but home is first. Um, embedded in the question as it was asked was that somehow that led me to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Um, and my answer to that is no. Um, I don't think that there is a necessary path to the Supreme Court. There's a whole lot of luck involved in um, are you at the right place and at the right time. And I think if you live a life with a far off goal, intending to achieve something, you run the risk that circumstances may preclude you from reaching it, and you may live disappointed in some way. Um, I don't actually think that that's a very valuable way hmm. to perceive civic engagement as something that gets you somewhere. I think it's more important to see it as a way to excite your passion in life, to give you a life goal that gives meaning in and of itself. Hmm. And it just so happens that when you love what you do, people will often notice, and it will often lead you to better places. Sometimes it doesn't, it shouldn't matter. Because if you're enjoying and have that passion to help, to serve, it itself will provide meaning. And so uh, for me, that, and one of the students was asking about career advice. Um, I think that's valuable advice for anyone who wants to be anything. Mm -hmm. Find that path that excites you. I agree. Um, I agree with everything Justice Sotomayor said, and I will say that you never know what tomorrow will bring. I, I certainly didn't see myself at any point as on a path to the Supreme Court. But I think in all aspects of life, you invest yourself in what's in front of you that day, doing the best you can and making the most of the opportunities you have, both for service and learning and teaching and loving and building communities and, and everything that falls under that umbrella and then you just see what the next day brings. And then you have another opportunity and perhaps a different set of opportunities to do it then. And let me just say one quick word, Eric. You asked about place. Mm -hmm. And I think for young people especially, um, place might be receding in importance. But I would like to challenge young people to put place back in front. I think in an increasingly online world where people are living on social media or living in their you know, bedrooms on their devices or their computers, we're maybe losing a sense of place. And I think, of course, COVID didn't help this, that we're losing a sense of interpersonal, face-to-face -face interactions. But I think place and people are critical to building a civic society, just living in a world where we're entirely online and we're disconnected from the people who are actually around us and from place. I think is destructive to the social fabric. Mm. Now, well, I sound like an old person, Andy, <laughs> but sitting in a restaurant and watching two young people uh, not talking and on their tablets phones. or phones instead of communicating, that's distressing to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you are right that um, you cannot learn how to live with others unless you live with, with others. Them. <clears throat> um, that there was maybe no better embodiment of that than someone I want to just bring into the room uh, or to bring her memory into the room, and that is the founder of iCivics, uh, Justice O'Connor, um, uh, mentor, model, pathbreaker, pathfinder for uh, both of you and many others in this room. And um, many folks, probably in this nerd, room of civic nerds, you all know this, but many people do not know that Justice O'Connor, prior to having been tapped to the U.S. Supreme Court, had been a politician had been a member of the Arizona State Senate, uh, majority, Senate leader. majority leader in the state Senate, um, and in a Senate that was uh, very purple at the time. And so she had to learn how to navigate difference and conversation with people from the big city and from rural areas, people who had more um, of a leaning towards strong government, people who had a real allergy to government. Uh, and she had to kind of broker deals and compromises um, in that role, uh, which prepared her well. Uh, for her time on the court, right? And I um, mean, that pivots to the second question that uh, Tithi was asking about how the two of you think about navigating differences uh, on the court. Um, this is a perennial question. 
Um, we're sitting here a week after a recent uh, decision. Um, this question all the time uh, that uh, we can read the opinions uh, and see the evidence of the ways in which you've thought about things and argued things uh, productively. Uh, but, um, you know, and we can even maybe get a ticket to come see your oral arguments. But what we can't get is, of course, how you spend time with each other. And giving us as appropriate a glimpse as you can for how in the everyday flow of work you navigate differences of opinion on, an, on a topic or differences in worldview uh, that maybe even expand beyond uh, the given topic and how, um, as a matter, again, of skills and norms, you go about doing that uh, uh, both in the specific instance but in a way that also sustains the institution um, and keeps it going. Well, what you see is the final product but what you don't see until Justice's papers are released is all the give and take that goes into that final product. And one thing that's a very strong norm on the court is trying to accommodate one another in the drafting of opinions. So I think one thing that's different about our work than the work of a legislature is that there's kind of a line beyond which we can't compromise. You know, we wouldn't vote trade. Um, Justice Sotomayor and I both take an oath to uphold the Constitution, and, and our job is to say what we think the right answer is to the best of our ability. So neither of us can compromise on that, on the bottom line, but there's a lot that we can compromise on and how we write opinions. Um, you know, you have the ability to write an opinion more broadly or more narrowly. Not everything has to be decided in an opinion. And we have a norm that people try to accommodate that. I work very hard to do that. And sometimes, I mean, the things that, the opinions that really I'm proudest of are ones in which we've been able to achieve consensus. Um, and by the way, you know, we do that for one another. And this just isn't Justice Sotomayor and, and me. We do that for one another across the court and even when you don't need the vote. So once you have a majority on the court, you know, if someone asks, would you think about taking this out? Would you think about taking that out? I mean, you're limited by what other people will agree to, too. But we all work very, very hard down to like little word choices <laughs> oftentimes, down to sm the smallest word choices to accommodate one another. And I think that really helps. I don't think any of us has a my way or the highway attitude. Um, and I think we've been able to work, you and I have been able to work together. Um, I think many of us do. Many. And, and uh, uh, Justice Barrett is right that the structure of our decision making, where you need a majority, so it gives you its own built-in norm because you have to accommodate at least five people to get that majority. Mm -hmm. uh, and often they're not five people, they're tugging at different directions and mm -hmm. you have to navigate and find that middle. But there is also an attempt to reach beyond the five um, and to talk in ways that each person can be comfortable with because in the end, when you're joining an opinion, you're putting your name and support behind it. Now, Eric, you mentioned Justice O'Connor. Um, she really was, and still is, to many on my court, the person who learned to establish the most important norm in the court. And that was a norm of collegiality. Mm. Um, prior to Justice O'Connor's coming to the court, uh, and she arrived in 1981, um, a tradition that had been there for a very long time at the beginning of our, um, of our court, um, the justices all lived in different places and far away from the uh, meeting place of the Supreme Court, and most of them stayed in the same hotel. And they ate lunch and dinner together, from what I understand. And it was required that everyone attend that social event. I think, although I don't know enough about this to have confirmed it, that they didn't really discuss cases during those mm. meals. And that had fallen into, not disfavor, but there had been a period in which the court was no longer socializing as often. And when Justice O'Connor came to the court, she reestablished that tradition. But most importantly, it was very, very significant to her in establishing 
our relationships vis-a-vis -vis work that we make as a priority collegiality. You mentioned she had done that when she was on the Arizona uh, State Senate. She had uh, routinely had barbecues at her home in which she invited both Democrats and Republicans. Um, I remember when I was being interviewed for my uh, uh, Supreme Court nomination that I met with many, many senators. And I asked them when things had changed in the sort of partisan nature of the Senate. Mm. And a few of them attributed it, and I know the media is going to be unhappy about this, to having uh, cameras in the, Senate, in the Senate and House chambers. Because with the cameras, people felt um, no longer an obligation to sit in the room with their colleagues. Mm. And so those conversations that occurred spontaneously in the corner or sitting side by side in the chamber were no longer occurring. Mm. Most of the time, the senators didn't have to be there because they had staffers watching. And I would see a debate going on, and I'd be sitting there being interviewed by a senator who had no volume on. So he never heard his colleagues speaking. That, thankfully, we avoid by the nature of our work because we're in every case together. We're in the same courtroom. We're hearing each other's thoughts. We're thinking about each other's thoughts. But that engagement, Amy, and you said it earlier, that place engagement, yeah. being in the same place, listening, is an important part of working together. There's so much in what you both have said here. I want to unpack a little bit of it. So um, in describing um, that norm of collegiality, the getting together um, for social gatherings or just breaking bread with one another and talking about things that aren't the cases before you, uh, about family, about sports, about you know whatever it might be, interests, um, is in part just about not just collegiality, but what you're describing as a humanization. It's really difficult, uh, even in the circumstance that you have where nine of you have to work together all the time, um, you can't dehumanize each other if you've actually spent time talking about your lives, about how you were formed, about you know, what your hopes and dreams are for the people who are close to you. If you've talked about that, it's very difficult to just say, oh, well, this justice is such and such, and just put them in a two-dimensional two box. But the other thing that you're naming here um, in talking about the cameras um, is the kind of set of incentives um, and the tension in civic life. I mean, part of why this room is full and people are tuning in um, is that the Supreme Court, by habit, by norms, by tradition, um, you don't do a lot of broadcasting of your work. You don't have cameras um, in the courtroom. You don't let people in and do documentaries on the part where people are you know, uh, doing the kind of you know, exchanging of notes back to haggle over language and so forth. And that helps you do your work in the most collegial way possible. right? And so there's an argument there for uh, people could get along better um, if they're not feeling like they have to perform, in a sense. And cameras. Um, in the well of the Senate or the House of Representatives creates a different set of incentives for performance. I'm going to perform in a certain way, and I'm, I'm going to be less relational and more performative, which, you know, all the, all the language that older people like us use to criticize the young generation and to criticize performative nature of social media, it's as old as everything. It's as old as TV. It's as old as radio. It's as old as when pamphleteering first came out. Every form of media creates incentives for people in public life to perform for who they think their base is, rather than actually deal with each yeah. other as humans. Um, but the Supreme Court, through all this time, has tried to preserve a bit of a bubble of that kind of media-exempt uh, uh, collegiality and trust within. And I guess one question I have that comes now, to Eric, mind. That's yeah. because we also have um, a situation where um, our decisions are always public. Yes. We write our decisions and explain how we got to where we got. And I fear that in other public spheres, there isn't that real opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the cameras provide the opportunity for explanation as opposed to um, having the citizenry sort of engage in thinking through what led their politician to mm. make a choice. Mm. And that is a, a norm that I think we've lost, actually. 
I think there was more of that in the past in America, where people actually sat down and heard debates on public issues. Mm. And it used to occur very much in the Senate. And I remember um, in much earlier times where you would see at, on, the da on daily news shows clips of two senators going back and forth on an issue. And you got a sense of what was motivating each of them and what were the issues that they thought was impo were important. Today, you've got more press releases mm. than explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that needs to be built up more in the process. You're naming a thing that we often in our, our work, we teach the difference between free expression and free exchange. That free expression is just, you know, what you get is a, a series of people expressing their points of view without necessarily tuning into each other or dealing with each other. What you're describing is exchange. Um, the expression in order to actually, hmm, I hadn't thought of it that way. Or uh, you raise something that I guess I should, I should accommodate somehow. I should, I should consider that facet. And um, in, in doing that depth of free exchange within the chambers of the court, um, I want to probe a little bit more on, on the question that Tithi was asking, though. I mean, when you have, you talked about the compromise and the give and take, um, but like any, uh, you know, Justice Thomas has called this a family, sometimes a dysfunctional family, right? That's <laughs> the nature of any family. You get into uh, things where you might get hot under the collar or you just feel like, ah, I feel really strongly about this. How do you, even when you're talking about the meat of a case and you feel very impassioned, come back and deal with each other in a way that isn't kind of still... Um, hot and tempted to kind of dehumanize or flatten the other. We don't speak in a hot way in our conferences. Mm -hmm. We no, do not we raise voices, no matter you know, how, you know, how hot button the case. We always speak with respect. There's a norm for how we speak. The Chief Justice begins because he's the most senior, and you go around in a circle, uh, most senior down to most junior, and you say what you think about the case, and the norm is that you cannot interrupt the other person. So we hear everybody out, and it's not until everybody has spoken that there then can be some back and forth. But we do not interrupt one another, and we never raise voices. And it would be a big violation of norms to do so. And that makes it easier, even if inside you're um, frustrated or hot under the collar, as mm -hmm. you put it, Eric. You don't express that in the conference room, which makes it easier um, when you go back you know, to your chambers and then go to meet at lunch, you're not carrying over something negative. You're not, you don't feel guilty about looking someone across the lunch table. Justice Sotomayor, we have assigned seats at lunch. Justice Sotomayor and I sit across from one another. Um, and, Basically, uh, you're describing the rules of a really good preschool. <laughs> <laughs> Don't raise your voices, sit in the Don't spot. That is true, that is true. And, and we, we sit in the seat of the justice that you succeeded. So I sit mm. in the seat that Justice Ginsburg has. It's one, it's one place in, in our dining room where we do not sit in order of seniority. Um, you sit in, in, in order of the seat that you had taken. But we sit across from one another. And I know that Justice Sotomayor respects me and we have affection for one another. I respect her very much. Even when we disagree deeply about the merits, we keep it to the merits, we keep it in our discussions, and we keep it, even when it's heated, on the page of our opinions. Um, and I wish, if there's one thing that I, I want to communicate to you and to the students who are watching, it is that, that the court is a place where we have civil disagreement. Um, and we are simultaneously the most transparent branch, I think, because as Justice Sotomayor says, you know exactly why we reached the decisions that we did, because we make that transparent. But then also, we keep a great deal confidential, and mm -hmm. I think that gives us the room to be able to deliberate and talk and think. It's, it's not a rowdy, um, it's, it's not like the floor of parliament, uh, certainly. Um, but we, we work very hard to maintain those norms, and I think we're successful. We are, generally. And, and the rule of hearing each other out, I mm. think, is terrifically important because it permits you to listen to something you disagree with and know that you'll get your turn to explain why you do. That's not to say, Amy, that people are passionate. Mm -hmm. There are issues that, that do, uh, uh, that are important to people mm -hmm. in a more visceral way. And in the presentation, you can see, see that. 
And occasionally someone might come close to something that could be viewed as hurtful. Ha happened uh, in my experience a few times. Generally, one of our senior colleagues will call the person who was perceived to maybe have gotten a little close and tell them, eh, maybe you should think of an apology or patching it up a little bit. Um, and that does happen. Uh, it happens in writing. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, something, someone writes something that an individual feels is offensive, not just explanatory of a view, mm -hmm. but personally offensive to them or could be perceived by others as um, offensive. And there is dialogue around that, mm -hmm. an attempt to find a different word or a different expression. Um, and it happens because um, it's just human nature that you might not, you're, you're stuck in your own head writing about the thing that's important to you, and you may forget momentarily how others may be perceiving it. So all of these things are ways to manage emotion without losing respect for one another and without losing an understanding that each of us is operating in good faith. And I think the public discourse has lost some of that. Yes. There's a lot of personal attacks on people's character. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't ever feel that a disagreement among us uh, involves our character. We are all people of good faith. We are all very passionate about the work we do. We are all trying to do our best and to support the principles of the Constitution as much as we can and according to the principles that guide us. Um, I, I may disagree with how many of my colleagues approach these questions, but I'm very vocal about that disagreement, and, and I lay out why I think they're wrong, and I hope someday they'll see the error of their ways. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we, you, you've been answering, this has like been a great Socratic uh, 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 session in one of your classes. Uh, you've been naming some of the questions, some of the answers to the questions that have been posed here, um, just in talking about these norms, these skills, uh, this knowledge that you bring to bear. And one of the things that's undergirding both, uh, things that you both said there about the court, um, is that you have to do these things because the baseline norm at the court is that this is a, that you're involved in a game of infinite repeat play. That the object here is not to make a minority lose so that you can get rid of them and get them you know, off the face of the earth and out of the court. You are stuck with each other, and this court is going to be here forever as long as the United States is forever, right? And what you were describing as the less healthy forms of free exchange that are in the wider political culture right now um, have a lot to do with the way in which there is a scorched earth mentality now of, I don't want to simply engage in debate with this person. I would rather that the person from the other side just not be here. I would rather not have to deal with that way of thinking. I would rather not have to kind of encounter that point of view, either because I find it repugnant or because I think they find me repugnant, and I don't want to have to deal with that discomfort. But you have no, you don't have the luxury of exempting yourselves from discomfort in that way. And in that, there is actually a set of lessons for the rest of us outside the chambers uh, in how to uh, practice this kind of civil uh, disagreement. Uh, By nature, we need five, and you're not guaranteed any lineup of five. So I may not have Amy in this case, but yes. I certainly will need her tomorrow on something else. And Justice Barrett, you've said this in other settings that the public uh, thinks that, oh, things, you know, because there are six, you know, uh, with one uh, perceived ideological leaning and three of another, that the court's 6-3 all the time, but you've pointed out how many cases in any given term scramble those uh, uh, numbers, and it's not 6-3, and it's a different combination of folks all the time. Mm -hmm. And I should say, as a matter of norms, both for our discussion and for our friends in the media, um, that one of the norms of this kind of conversation is that we don't discuss uh, opinions, uh, and we don't discuss the particulars of cases uh, before the court, but uh, I think within that context, um, uh, Justice Barrett, we were talking in the green room before we came out about, uh, again, just to connect the dots between uh, the personal and the civic, about how just in family life uh, you found it important to be able to teach uh, your children how to apologize. Uh, and we were reflecting in conversation about what a lost or missing art that is 
in civics and in civic life generally. Uh, again, in a social media inflamed age where it's about owning the other guy, it's about shaming them, it's about kind of crushing them and, uh, and, and humiliating them, uh, that actually being able to own the fact that, oh, maybe I overstepped, or maybe I didn't see that point that you were making, uh, or maybe I just totally stepped in it, uh, uh, or maybe I got hot in a way that uh, uh, later on I thought, oh, that wasn't so productive, you know, uh, but that we've lost that art. And um, can you tell us more just about your thinking about that, uh, that, that skill uh, of taking responsibility for one's own part um, in what might be uh, an exchange of hurt that could require an apology? Of course, and I'm glad that Justice Sotomayor brought up that sometimes we do need to apologize because it is, we are human, and so sometimes you say something that comes across maybe in a way that you didn't intend. And what I had been saying to Eric in the green room ahead of time is that apology, you know, and what I, what I try to teach my children, you know, if, if there's a disagreement, you know, I'll say, well, apologize. And the response is, I don't feel sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> And I'm going to wait until I feel sorry to apologize. That day, I promise, will never come. Um, sorry, you know, forgiveness and apology are not emotions. They're decisions. You decide to acknowledge that you were wrong. And sometimes, even if you think the other person misunderstood what you said, I mean, I think the value of a relationship can be, you know, to say, listen, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean for it to come across that way, and I, I did not intend to hurt you. Um, but I think apology and then receiving apology, assuming the best of the other person, assuming that the other person indeed did not try to hurt you, or even if you think they did, even if they overstepped. How many times has any of us overstepped and said something that came across in an unkind way, d deliberately or, or, or accidentally? So I think those skills are important. And you know, we were talking about family, and Eric, you were saying that this is an institution in which we can't obliterate one another. Um, <laughs> The Supreme Court is, is, I've heard it described as an arranged marriage with no opportunity for divorce. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't choose one another as colleagues. We have life tenure, so we're not going anywhere. So we have to get along. A and I, I mean, I'm joking about that, but isn't, shouldn't that be true of all of us in a civic community? Why should any of us want to obliterate the opposition or even see another person as the opposition? I mean, I think we should all be trying to get along. I want to pivot, um, picking up on, um, you spoke actually already to a couple of questions that came from the students about um, uh, paths, about the paths that you took, and I thought Justice Sotomayor, the, the wisdom of your answer to that, that uh, you don't set out to end up on the Supreme Court, set out to uh, find a, a point of passion and pursue that. Um, and then you'll end up on the Supreme Court. So. <laughs> uh, that maybe. was a subject. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Um, but I, I want to uh, zoom out to something that's been implicit in how we're talking about civil discourse. Uh, sometimes conversations about uh, civility uh, can paper over the fact that there are, in fact, proper divides uh, in civic life. There are areas of deep foundational disagreement. Uh, and again, in our work, we teach America is an argument. America is an argument between Liberty and equality, which again, the average American thinks is, it's mom and apple pie, I love them both. Uh, but when you actually play them out in cases, you realize, oh, these things are in tension with one another. Too much emphasis on liberty uh, impedes perhaps your emphasis on equality and vice versa. Um, there's a built-in tension between the pluribus part of our national motto and the unum part. There's a built-in tension between uh, local self-government, local control, and national purpose and the ability to solve national problems. And, uh, and that if we are to live like a citizen in the way that Justice Sotomayor you're describing, um, we have to not only be learn civility and be able to kind of navigate a pluralistic society, which we are, but we have to know the arguments. We have to get fluent in the first place on what are these core things that uh, Americans uh, will always perpetually uh, be contending with and be contesting. A country that is founded on a creed is a built-in argument machine. Right? The, 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 uh, there is no Chinese idea when I think about my ancestors, ancestors from China. Um, and if there were a Chinese idea, it would be told from Xi Jinping on down what the Chinese idea is. But in the United States, the American idea, the set of creedal promises from our foundational documents, 
um, only gives us an invitation to continually argue, debate, uh, and contest the meaning of equal protection of the laws, of equal justice under law. And so I, I would like you to speak to us about how we outside the court, uh, and, not, and even we outside this room of people who are, again, you know, the highly motivated, um, the self-selected into this stuff, um, how we can learn more to get fluent in these core arguments in American life and to be able, as a matter of knowledge, but then as a matter of skills, get comfortable with arguing, right? One of the things that we've we created a project uh, that says that, look, the thing we don't, as toxically polarized as we are in American life right now, we don't need fewer arguments. We just need less stupid ones. And, <laughs> and that led to a thing called the Better Arguments Project, which connects with the National Governors Association initiative that you two both spoke at a couple weeks ago called the Argue Better uh, Initiative, trying to get, in that case, Republican and Democratic governors um, to deal with each other. Again, not just like, hey, let's be friends. They say, let's talk about movies and sports and humanize each other, but actually let's learn how to argue better because we do have differences in worldview on the role of the state, on the role of the market, on the role of the citizen in everyday life. And so how, from what you know and what you do, how can we get better at arguing? I mean, I would say, you know, getting better at arguing fundamentally is about getting better at relating with people because that has to do in, that has to do with how you go about arguing and whether you are demonizing the other person, for mm -hmm. example. But Eric, you also asked about how do we know what the arguments are mm -hmm. and, and, and to argue better. And I would say that in the area of, of what we do, in the area of the Constitution and figuring out what these arguments are on either side, to seek out resources like the National Constitution Center does a great job when it's talking about it. It will talk about cases on the court's docket. It will talk about concepts of constitutional law and present people who have opposing viewpoints. So it gives, you can listen to it in a podcast. Um, on When I was a law professor, I wrote one of them. Um, they have, you know, you, you will have the, uh, whatever amendment, the suspension clause or the 15th amendment, our Article 1, every provision within Article 1, and it will have opposing views. You get the text, and then you get scholars with opposing views of the scope of that amendment or what it might mean in American society. And I think drawing on resources like that that are nonpartisan and are designed to lay out all the arguments is a way to disagree better because you have better arguments. But then I think I would just kind of go back to the theme that we've been hammering home this whole time, is that once you have your ideas, I'm not gonna, believe me, I'm not gonna change Justice Sotomayor's mind about fundamental things, right? But we learn to, we learn from one another, we learn to give where we can, and it's all framed in the kind of dialogue that's respectful, that apologizes when apology is necessary, and that understands we live in a pluralistic society. One side can't take all. It can't be, you know, it can't be a complete conquest of ideas on either side because we are a huge, very diverse society and we have to figure out how to live under one roof. Media li literacy is a big thing right now. Mm -hmm. um, lots of talk about fake news. Um, however you define it, it exists. Yeah. All right? There is a, a lot of that there is an obligation as a person interested in the world to find sources that you can rely upon, to be objective about the pros and cons of every situation. There is no perfect approach to constitutional law. There are exceptions. Um, for every, uh, for my uh, textualist colleagues, I could probably point to a number of their decisions that depart in some way. There's always a principled reason for why they're doing it, but there is always a reason. And so with any way that you look at the world, they are you are not going to address a certain subset of problems that probably motivate the opposition into believing that it's not a solution. And that's where the area of compromise becomes so important. Um, when you're talking about liberty, you also have to worry about security. And what we do as a society is always try to balance where's the right point. And there is a point you have to reach. And the society has played with it in various ways, some of them not so healthy. World War II, with the internment of the Japanese, I think we have all as a society uh, realized that we went too far in the name of security. 
um, interning American citizens with no cause whatsoever than their ancestry was just much further than any concept of liberty or equal protection should go. So that part of understanding that you just can't study your side. Mm. You have to study the other side and you have to look for in their arguments the weaknesses that they're pointing to in yours. And if you can't learn how to do that, you will never be able to engage in a meaningful conversation with someone else. In actual exchange. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, or reaching a way of solution to a problem. You know, the, the, the last question I want to pose to you grows out of things that you, you've both spoken to. You know, Justice Barrett, when you, when you were talking about this idea that on the court, certainly, you can't um, obliterate, uh, uh, quote unquote, the opposition, and you can't even think about people as the opposition. In a way, what you're teaching us um, in the patterns of behavior uh, on the court is uh, both how to be better losers and better winners. Uh, in the case of a setting where you are continually having to deal with each other, right? Um, Justice Sotomayor, when you spoke of the internment of Japanese Americans uh, after Pearl Harbor um, and how now today we Americans you know, regard uh, that as a serious error both under law and under norms, the fact that we Americans have come to that was not a process really of legal judgment. There was an act of Congress that uh, provided some reparation. Uh, but really, it was a matter of norms. And what I want to close on is what you've been talking about here so much in this conversation. You've given us real insight into the way that the structure of the institution of the court operates. Um, but again, in our work, we teach that culture precedes structure. The culture, the norms, values, narratives, habits, the ways that we choose to live together or not, shapes the frame of the possible when you get to the operations of the structure. right? Um, and I think so many of the things you've described, I and mean, we joked about it as preschool, but it is in fact like if any, if all of us actually took to heart and said, what is a circle that I work in uh, or move in where I could have these rituals, these norms, these explicit expectations that nobody speaks twice before everyone's spoken once, um, that we sit in these seats that are not just assigned seats, but in a sense, inherited seats, seats that we are stewards of, because every one of us you don't have to sit on Supreme Court. Every one of us is a steward of a seat in civic life. And if we started thinking in those terms, there's so much actually that we could do, but it'd have to be on purpose, right? And I think that's what's most uh, striking about what you're describing here is how much of the culture of the court is on purpose. Um, and I'd like you both just to speak to this, again, with words of advice for both the young people who pose questions and for all of us. How can we, in our lives and work, um, build containers of culture, of civic culture, uh, that move things in a healthier direction that uh, you've been embodying and that uh, we've been talking about here today? I start always by finding the best in people. If you start there, it is the perfect place to accept that every human being there may be an exception. <laughs> I say this only because I was a former prosecutor, and I've often said, prosecuted many, many people, and there were only a couple that I came to the conclusion that they were evil people. Um, fundamentally, that they were missing some component of humanity. Um, but that was very rare. In, in reality, virtually everyone has good in them. And if you spend the time looking for that, it is harder to demonize that person and their arguments. And if you bear that in mind as you listen to people with whom you disagree, that they have a reason for why they're thinking a particular way, and you make the effort to engage them in figuring that out that there is much more possibility that you will remain not just civil to each other, but that you might actually grow to like each other. There are historical examples of Democrats and Republicans as senators, I say males because that was our history for so long, 
but many of them were the best of friends. And yet they voted differently so often, but they did manage compromise often as well. Um, but I think that you can find a way to improve virtually any situation if you start with it, finding what's the best in each other. Mm. Thank you, Justice. I think finding the best and assuming the best, and you know, Eric, you pointed out the number of norms that we have that are very deliberate, that over time, you know, the court deliberately chose and continues to deliberately follow. And I guess one thing I would challenge the students who are listening to do is to make a deliberate choice to seek out people who think about things differently than you and spend time with them. Um, and it can start just by spending time. I mean, you, you probably have to make that affirmative choice because otherwise, by the process of just kind of naturally gravitating towards people who think like you, it probably will take some effort to make that choice. You know, people have book clubs. They talk about movies or Netflix shows at lunch. Why not talk about something, like read a book together that has to do with civic engagement, mm -hmm. like Eric's book. Um, read a book and talk about it and get practice talking about ideas, arguing about ideas, and as Justice Sotomayor says, listening to the other side, listening to those arguments and working through them. We have to create opportunities for those kinds of dialogues to become practiced at them. Well, I want to- I got some of it from debate club when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the same way that Justice Sotomayor said, we're talking here today about small c citizenship. I, I do lead an organization called Citizen University, but I want to end with small c and small u. We are all here today um, students in a small c, small u citizen university, learning how to live together, learning how to practice uh, what Justice Sotomayor and Barrett um, have been sharing with us. Uh, and learning how to figure out how we shall live together uh, as a diverse pluralistic society <laughs> that is, uh, by definition, in a way that is a feature and not a bug, deeply divided. Uh, and that if we can learn to embrace that, uh, uh, we can give this great experiment in self-government uh, one more round to go and pass it on to another generation. I want to thank our justices so much for this great conversation. <laughs> We will, and we will now pass the mic. Thank you. Wow. I have to say, I was invited to come give a few words and some remarks, and I was like, I get to go after the justices. That was so exciting. Uh, what a wonderful, 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 thought-provoking, engaging conversation. Um, I'm so excited to be in this room of civic nerds in the small C, small U, or big C, big U. Um, I feel like I'm in a room of NEH staffers. Uh, we're so delighted to have these conversations and to talk about this important work. But my name is Shelley Lowe. I'm Navajo. I'm originally from Ganado, Arizona, and I'm chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I want to give a huge um, shout out and thanks to Justice Sotomayor and Justice Barrett for their commitment to civic education, for coming to speak to us today, for taking time to share some stories with us. I learned a lot about the work that they do and how they do this work within the court. I want to thank the students who asked questions and helped us to really probe what was going on and how they think about the work that they do. And of course, I want to thank Eric Liu for moderating this thought-provoking conversation and also for bringing up Sandra Day O'Connor because as an Arizonan, we take credit for her all the time. <laughs> 
So it's such a pleasure to be here to celebrate with you during Civic um, Learning Week for the work that you've done, for the, what we all do as we continue to support civic learning in America, for people of all ages and of all backgrounds to ensure that the general public has the tools necessary for informed citizenship. We are so grateful for Civic Learning Week and programs like this that help advance this very important work. You know, I wanna say in 2000, maybe 2008, 18, late 2018 and into 2019, I was on the 26th member of the National Council for the Humanities, the advisory group for the National Endowment for Humanities. And we read this just very amazing and exciting proposal from iCivics, a project for educating for American democracy. And we had a lot of conversation about the project through our council members, uh, members from both sides of the political aisle. And it was so encouraging to think that this work was being proposed and that there was this idea that we could bring civics education forward across the country and really create a roadmap for how that would work. So I want to thank, or I want to acknowledge iCivics and everything that they have done to really move this forward. I also want to quickly acknowledge two of our staff who have been very essential in this work, Mark Ruppel, a program officer, and uh, Jeff Hardwick, who is the director of our public programs, because they have done a wonderful job helping us to spearhead this. And I spend a lot of time talking about humanities, right? So I say a lot of times that humanities to me is our creation stories. And for me, it's the Navajo creation stories that teaches me how to be a person in this world, how to live among other people, how to be an appropriate person, how to do things so that I can always seek harmony and balance and live to a nice ripe old age. But I think that humanities is also other stories, stories of translation and stories of exchange. They are novels that inspire us. They are the history that stirs us. They are the poetry that often awakens something inside of us. And stories give us meaning in our lives. They set us on new paths. They remind us that we are not alone. And as long as we keep looking, as long as we keep asking, as long as we keep reflecting, and as Justice Sotomayor said, so poignantly, as long as we keep hoping, we can continue to move forward. The Navajo creation story tells me that I need to do all of these things so that I can live in beauty. But I think it's when we keep doing these things, when we keep looking and asking and reflecting and hoping, that we can actually see through these tools of humanities the beauty that is all around us. The National Endowment for the Humanities is particularly proud of our work through a new initiative that we have called American Tapestry, weaving together past, present, and future, which leverages the humanities to strengthen our democracy, advance equity for all, and address our changing climate. And as part of last year's Civic Learning Week, we announced funding to create pilot programs at elementary schools that serve urban, rural, and tribal communities based on the roadmap to educating for American democracy. And we, are, we continue to be pleased with the progress of the implementation of the EAD roadmap and the evaluation of this implementation. This rigorous inquiry-based civics and history education is happening nationwide with partnerships in museums, historic sites, and other informal educations that are providing teachers training and assisting schools in developing curricula that align with state standards. NEH is so proud to be a part of these efforts, and to date we have funded over $2.7 million towards educating for American democracy. And we do this to ensure that we are educating and engaging students in our nation's democratic process and principles, and that we can transform the teaching of history and civics to meet the needs of our 21st century students. Now, the best thing about working in humanities and talking about humanities is I can draw on things, tools of the humanities like poetry. One of my favorite writers, and I'm sure one of your favorite writers as well, is the former U.S. Poet Laureate and the member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, Joy Harjo. In her poem, Once the World Was Perfect, she imagines a group of people living in harmony. They get along, and they were happy in that world. But then doubt creeps in followed by fear and greed and envy. And soon the world descends into chaos until one person shares a blanket with someone else. 
And that spark of kindness, as Joy writes, shines a light. And I think the humanities are that light. They remind us we are not in the dark. We are in this together, that here is a light. And the humanities remind us this light can be our way home. Seeing civic engagement and education as a light, we can and will move forward together. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Please welcome back Louise Dubay of iCivics. All right. I'm sure you've had enough of me already all day. Um, it's uh, my honor to thank you, Chair Lowe, for your support for Educating for American Democracy. Without uh, your support, we could not do this work, and it's really important work, as we have seen today. Uh, I've heard throughout this day this idea of hope, even despite the difficulties we're in. And what particularly struck me about this conversation is hope that we are one community. We may be one locality, one state, but we are one country, American country, and that is uh, where I think we can see the hope for moving forward. Uh, it is my honor to serve the legacy of Sandra Day O'Connor, who you've heard a lot about today. Uh, she often said, it's great to be the first woman, but you better not be the last. So I want to thank her sisters-in-law, um, Justices Sotomayor and Barrett, for ensuring that that didn't happen. Uh, she was not the last woman on the court. This will bring uh, to a close the live stream for our national forum. Uh, thousands of people are watching online, not only people here in this room, and we thank you. I just, before I uh, let you go, I want to save the date. Tentatively, we're thinking next year, March 10th to 14th, 2025, as the third annual Civic Learning Week. So we'll tell you more about it very soon. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, please tune in again this evening. We'll have a fantastic program with the Archivist of the United States, Dr. Col Dr. Colleen Shogan, and Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, live at the National Archives, our partner, at 7.30. So you can join back in at that time. Before I end, this program um, looks good. It's all fun but it actually comes together from a lot of people. So I would ask the iCivic staff to stand up if any of you are here in this room. Please stand up. You are very humble. Um, please stand up. Thank you for everything you've done to make this day a success. I want to call out Patricia Leslie, who's behind the curtain here, um, as any uh, good... Um, uh, stage manager would be our uh, Amber Cruz Mooring, who I think is in in the back. A fantastic job, Ace Parsi, who coordinates our uh, Civic Learning Week partners uh, online. Uh, Karen McCall, uh, without whom nothing would happen. Uh, Natasha Scott, who organized a lot of the state uh, coalitions uh, to have programming in their state, which is really important. So thank you all for everything that you do. Uh, for those who are here in person, now it's your turn. We listened to you last year. You guys said, we need to have more time to talk in depth with our groups. We want to go in depth in smaller groups. So we structured the program this year so you have an opportunity to do that. You have some fantastic facilitators. Your program tells you where those breakout sessions are. They're all upstairs or somewhere around here. So with that, I'm gonna let you go and go to your breakout session and have great conversations. See you tonight. Thank you so much.